Welcome, welcome to the 2023 uh, Palmer Lecture, during which we are going to honor our 2023 uh, Palmer Prize winner, uh, Michael Sandel, um, even though it is already 2024. Um, so I am Dean Anita, Anita Krug, uh, as I think most of you are aware, and it's really welcome each of you uh, to our annual lecture. Uh, and um, and I want to tell you a little bit about the prize. The Palmer Prize was established in 2007 uh, by a Chicago Kent alumnus, alumnus Roy C. Palmer and his wife, Sam Palmer, uh, to honor the exemplary works uh, to honor exemplary works of scholarships that explore um, threats to or supports of. Uh, uh, the liberal democratic constitutional order. Uh, the prize is designed to encourage uh, and reward uh, debates among scholars on current issues affecting the rights of individuals and uh, the responsibilities of governments throughout the world. Roy Palmer was a lawyer and real estate developer uh, and a 1962 honors graduate of Chicago Kent, as well as a member of our board of advisors. Uh, in 2012, he received the Chicago Kent Alumni Association's Distinguished Service Award, and in 2013, he was named one of our 125 Alumni of Distinction. Uh, before his death in 2017, he and Mrs. Palmer were active in numerous civic, social, and philanthropic uh, organizations. Uh, Susan Palmer uh, traveled to Chicago to be here at this event, as she does every year, but unfortunately, she was under the weather. Uh, this morning and uh, and couldn't be with us today. Uh, however, we are very pleased uh, to have uh, Roy's daughters, Heather and Allison Palmer, in, in the audience. So I welcome both of them. They're standing over uh, over against the wall. Um, <laughs> It's really wonderful to see both of you, and of course, we wish uh, Mrs. Palmer a very speedy recovery. Thank you. Uh, so, I also want to thank our selection committee uh, for this, uh, for uh, determining uh, the winner of this award, and each of them carefully read all of the manuscripts that that we received. Uh, they are professors Steve Heyman. Mark Rosen and Chris Schmidt. So thanks so much. So today, joining our distinguished um, scholars who have won the Palmer Prize in previous years is Michael J. Sandel, who is the uh, Anti and Robert M. Bass Professor of Government at Harvard University, uh, where he uh, teaches political philosophy and and writes about. Uh, 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 justice, ethics, democracy, markets, you know, and other niche subjects. Mm -hmm. uh, um, we're honoring today Professor Sandel from his book, Democracy's Discontent, a new edition for our perilous times, which was published by Harvard University Press in 2023. Uh, this book is uh, the latest of many books and writings that Professor Sandel has authored. Uh, which connect enduring themes uh, to some of the most challenging moral and political questions of our time. Collectively, these writings have been translated into more than 30 languages. Uh, his course, Justice, is the first Harvard course to be made freely available online and has been viewed by tens of millions of people across the globe. His lectures have packed uh, venues such as St. Paul's Cathedral in London, the Sydney Opera House, uh, and an outdoor stadium in Seoul where 14,000 people came to hear him speak. So clearly, Professor Sandel has, has sought to extend uh, the reach of philosophy beyond uh, the academy. And his new online course, Tech Ethics, explores <coughs> the ethical dilemmas posed by AI, chatbots, and social media. The BBC Radio 4 series, The Public Philosopher, explores the philosophical uh, ideas lying behind the headlines uh, with rapt audiences around the world. Uh, Professor Sandel, and, and there's just so much to get through here, uh, has been a pioneer in uh, the use of technology to promote global public discourse in a new BBC series 
the global philosopher. He leads um, video uh, uh, discussion, video online discussions with participants from a range of countries on the ethical aspects of issues such as immigration and climate change. In the U.S., Professor Sandel has served on the President's Council on Bioethics and is America, a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. He received his undergraduate degree from Brandeis University and his doctor, doctorate from Oxford University, which he attended as a Rhodes Scholar. I also have to mention that my personal connection with Professor Sandel goes way back. I was a teaching fellow for uh, two or three semesters in his various courses. And he was also a member of my dissertation committee, uh, for which I will always be grateful. And he, he let me on through. So, uh, without further delay, uh, I welcome uh, Professor Michael J. Sandel. Thank you, Greenberg. What a thrill it is to return and to hear that wonderfully warm and generous introduction from uh, a then student, now colleague and friend. We go back a very long way. What a, what a privilege and honor it is to be here and uh, to be amidst your colleagues um, and to see you presenting as dean over this great law school. So thank you very much. And thank you also to the committee for honoring the new edition of Democracy's Discontent. The central theme of the book as it emerged in the 1990s was that the American political and constitutional tradition is defined by a kind of persisting tension between two public philosophies, two ways of understanding freedom, between a liberal conception of freedom that conceives liberty to consist in the ability to choose our ends for ourselves, unimpeded by external obstacles. And what I call in the book a civic Republican conception of freedom that says we are only fully free, not as individuals choosing our ends or pursuing our consumer interests, but as citizens, as democratic citizens capable of deliberating with our fellow citizens about common purposes and ends. So the book begins with the contract between liberal Republican, small r, Republican conceptions of freedom. And it tries to show that both strands have been present throughout the American political and constitutional experience, but in shifting measure relative importance. Broadly speaking, the book tries to show that the civic Republican conception of freedom predominated earlier and gradually in the 20th century and especially after the Second World War, gave way to the liberal conception of freedom. I try to show how this happened, how this can be glimpsed in the shifting terms of public discourse, especially public discourse about the economy. Now, characteristic of the liberal conception of what an economy is for is the individualist or the consumerist conception freedom. What is an economy for? What else might an economy be for on the civic Republican conception of freedom? Economic arrangements should be assessed not only from the standpoint of promoting GDP and providing fair access to the fruits of, of prosperity and abundance, but also from the standpoint of self-government. I call this the political economy of citizenship. And I suggest that early on in the history of the Republic, economic arrangements were assessed from this point of view, from the standpoint not only of their contribution to economic growth and fair distribution, but also from the standpoint of cultivating citizens capable of sharing in self-government. 
But gradually, this changed. This strand went into a place. Let me offer one concrete example drawn from the law. The law of antitrust. When antitrust anti-monopoly law was enacted in the late 19th century and in the early 20th century, its primary purpose was not, as we commonly think of it today, to keep big companies from raising consumer prices. <clears throat> its primary purpose was a civic purpose. It was to break up large concentrations of power in the economy to make the economy amenable to democratic control. Louis Brandeis, before he was appointed to the US Supreme Court, was one of the most compelling and articulate uh, defenders, opponents of the civic conception of antitrust and anti-monopoly. He spoke of the curse of bigness. And the curse of bigness for Brandeis was not higher consumer prices. The curse of bigness was that too much concentrated power in the economy begins to exceed democratic control, to disempower democratic citizens. But as antitrust law evolved, and the New Deal is a moment of transition, it shifts, its purpose shifts. The reasons for enforcement, the rationale for enforcement in, in the Justice Department shifts away from breaking up big concentrations of power toward going after only those instances of antitrust that, have, that are detrimental to consumer welfare. Now, we associate the consumer welfare theory of antitrust with Robert Bork. But Bork actually comes late in the day after this was already unfolding, where the effect of on consumer prices uh, had come to be the main focal point of antitrust law. This is one example among many that I try to offer. It, it, that enable us to glimpse the shift in the underlying of the philosophy, in the implicit conceptions of freedom that are at play and that animate American political and constitutional discourse. Now, that was the main interpretive theme and remains the main interpretive theme of the book. But the interpretation animated the political worry. The worry was this, that a liberal public philosophy one that conceives freedom only in terms of enabling individuals to choose their ends or to pursue their interests is too weak to sustain the civic virtues and the sense of community that democracy requires. That was the word. And in the mid-1990s, when the first version of the book appeared, that was an optimistic time. That was a heady, self-confident time. It was a time of prosperity. It was a time when the Berlin Wall had fallen. It was a time when America's version of liberal democratic capitalism seemed the only game in town to it. It seemed to have inherited the future. They had no rivals in the world stage. And yet, amidst the peace and prosperity, Anxieties about the project of self-government, I thought, could be seen just beneath the surface. I can't resist reading just a small passage from this mid-1990s version, which is also in the present version. To the extent that contemporary politics puts sovereign states and sovereign selves in question, it is likely in other words, a public philosophy, a political practice, resting only on the liberal understanding of freedom. It is likely to provoke reaction from those who would banish ambiguity, shore up borders, harden the distinction between insiders and outsiders, and promise a politics to take back our culture and take back our country, to restore our sovereignty with a vengeance. 
that vengeful backlash arrived two decades later. And here we are. The grievances that elected Donald Trump in 2016 would not put to rest by his presidency or by his defeat after a single term in office. Some 25 years after, uh, after the, the first version came out, it's clear that democracy's discontent persists. In fact, today it's more rancorous, even lethal. In the 1990s, the discontent consisted mainly of inchoate anxiety. A growing sense that we were losing control of the forces that govern our lives, and a worry that the moral fabric of the community was unraveled. Those were the worries I wrote about at the time. As the global economy mattered more than the nation state, traditionally the site of self government mattered less. The scale of economic life was exceeding the reach of democratic control. In the quarter century since, these tendencies became accentuated. During the age of globalization, the project of self-government became more attenuated. So did the bonds among citizens. National loyalties and allegiances were eroded by the declining economic significance of national borders. The credential elites who flourished in the new economy discovered over the last few decades that they had more in common with their fellow entrepreneurs and innovators and professionals around the world than with their fellow citizens. As companies could find workers, and for that matter, consumers, half a world away, they became, the companies became less dependent on those closer to home. So this is how the tendencies of fracture, unraveling of the social fabric, deepen. For the winners of globalization, now looking back, the political divide, they said, that mattered was no longer left versus right, but open versus closed. This is how the leading figures, the proponents of the globalization project of the 90s and 2000s described it. Open versus closed. Those who questioned free trade agreements and the offshoring of jobs to low wage countries and the unfettered flow of capital across national borders, they were cast as closed minded as if opposition to neoliberal globalization were on a par with bigotry. By this logic, patriotism seemed atavistic, a flight from the open, frictionless world that beckoned, a consolation for the left behind. There was hubris in this, and also self-interest, perhaps. But it all came to a head in 2016. Britain's vote to leave the European Union that year shocked the well credentialed metropolitan elites, as did Trump's election a few months later. Brexit and Trump's border wall both symbolized a backlash against a market-driven technocratic mode of government that had produced enormous gains for some, mainly the top 10 or 20 percent. But job loss, wage stagnation, rising inequality, and a galling sense among working people that those elites looked down on them didn't value the work they did. 
the votes from this point of view, the votes for Brexit and for Trump were anguished attempts to reassert national sovereignty in part. And so anxieties about the loss of the, the erosion of community and the disempowerment, disempowerment that many people felt deeply became more acute over the past 25 years. Central to the civic Republican conception of freedom is the idea that self-government requires political institutions that can hold economic power to democratic account. It also requires that citizens identify sufficiently with one another to consider themselves engaged in a common project. Today, both conditions are in doubt. If something like this diagnosis is plausible, the path to revitalizing American democracy requires that we debate two questions that the technocratic politics of recent decades has obscured. First, how can we, how can we reconfigure the economy to make it amenable to democratic control? That's the political economy of citizenship question. And second, how can we reconstruct our social life to ease the polarization and enable Americans to become, to think of themselves as effective democratic citizens. Holding economic power to account and, in, and invigorating citizenship, a sense of community and mutual responsibility, these may seem to be two different political projects. The first is about power and institutions. The second is about identity and ideals. But a central theme, a central argument of democracy's discontent is that these two projects are connected. Unwinding the oligarchy capture of democratic institutions depends on empowering citizens to think of themselves as participants in a shared life. Now, how might we begin this rethinking? How might we begin to shift the terms of public discourse to reconnect with the political economy of citizenship, to reinvent it? To do that, it's worth considering the obstacles to doing so. And that means thinking back, looking back, over the past four decades or so, at the version of the globalization project that exacerbated these frustrations and sources of discontent. Any attempt to reimagine a political economy of citizenship relevant to our time depends on acknowledging what went wrong in recent decades. And part of what went wrong is that both political parties came to embrace and enact a new version of capitalism, one that brought widening inequalities and toxic politics. This version of capitalism consists of three mutually reinforcing practices and beliefs globalization, financialization, and meritocracy. The capitalism defined by these, uh, by these practices is a far cry from the political economy of citizenship. It even departed from the political economy of growth and distributive justice that prevailed in the decades <coughs> following the Second World War. Now, I'd like to draw attention to one feature of this, uh, the, the age of globalization, its view of, of politics. 
the age of globalization, it was a heady triumph. Political leaders celebrated the flow of goods and people and capital across national borders, not only for its promise of prosperity, but as an open, tolerant, cosmopolitan alternative to the place-bound political economy of the past. A world without walls, you remember that phrase, a world without walls, this became a, a familiar, high-minded euphemism for an economy in which national allegiances matter less and the unfettered flow of goods and capital mattered more. There were those who objected, who objected that the new, these new fluid arrangements enabled companies to send jobs overseas to low-wage countries with few environmental and labor protections. They worried that Moving capital into and out of countries at the click of a mouse could prompt destabilizing financial crises. To the critics, the proponents replied <coughs> with one brazen but seemingly compelling reply. Globalization, they said, is inevitable. It's a fact of nature beyond politics. And we heard this on the right and on the left, center right, center left, defending the rigors of free market capitalism in the 1980s. Margaret Thatcher frequently declared, there is no alternative. You remember that phrase of hers? There is no alternative. But it wasn't only Margaret Thatcher, it wasn't only figures, free market figures like Thatcher and Reagan. Center left political leaders of the 1990s reiterated this claim of inevitability. Bill Clinton put it this way, globalization is not something that you can put it off or turn off. It is the economic equivalent of a force of nature like wind or water, as Bill Clinton. Or Tony Blair, his counterpart in the UK. For Blair, Globalization was as unalterable as the seasons. Quote, I hear people say we have to stop and debate globalization. You might as well debate, he said, whether autumn should follow summer. Now, although depicted by its proponents as a force of nature beyond human control, it turned out that globalization demanded that governments enact quite an extensive list of contestable economic policies. But what's striking is this claim that the basic contours of the economy are facts of nature beyond human control. And that the path for politics is not to debate them, not to call them into question, not to ask about their suitability to the project of self-government. The task of politics is to adapt to them, to these forces of nature. Now, this view about the global economy being beyond democratic debate or control reduced set of policies that led to widening the economy. But not only that, the moral companion to the market triumphalist faith of the age of that period, moral companion was a certain set of attitudes towards success that arose from a certain kind of credentialist meritocracy. Credentialist meritocracy was the moral companion to the market triumphalist of these decades. It wasn't only the widening gap between rich and poor that led to the resentment that, that prompted the populist factor. It was also the changing attitudes towards success that accompanied the rise in inequality. Those on top came to believe that their success was their own doing, the measure of their merit, and that they therefore deserved 
the full bounty that the market bestows upon them. And by implication, that those who struggle must deserve their pay too. This way of thinking about success arises from a seemingly effective idea. The principle of meritocracy. The principle that says, so far as chances are equal, the winners deserve their winnings. Now, the center left politicians of the time acknowledged that chances were not truly equal. This was work in progress. We needed to, what we needed to do was to make the meritocracy more perfect, to bring everyone up to the same starting line. But insofar as we could, the winners deserve their winnings. For four decades, the market failed and the meritocratic faith taken together form the defining project of mainstream American politics. Neoliberal capitalism made some people rich and others poor, but meritocracy created the divide between winners and losers. And it is this divide, not income inequality alone, that gave rise to the sense of humiliation and resentment and grievance and being looked down upon that Trump and other authoritarian populists were able to exploit. Now, early on in the book, I write about the debate between Jefferson and Held back in the early days of the Republic. And what is a what is striking about that debate is both Jefferson and Hamilton still retain contact with the political economy of citizenship. Neither was talking only about promoting prosperity and uh, maximizing GDP. And I want to say one word about Alexander Hamilton before I try to draw the moral of the story and then uh, open, open this uh, for discussion. If you, but just a quick reminder, the first American party system emerged from a disagreement about the role of finance in Republican government. Hamilton didn't believe that the new national government could inspire the allegiance of the rich and the powerful through patriotism alone. He thought wealth, wealthy investors, you remember from American history, wealthy investors would only support it if they had a financial stake in the success. And that's why Hamilton proposed a system of public finance that would bind the wealthy to the national project in a way that patriotism and civic virtue would not. Now, Jefferson and Madison were appalled by this. They saw this as a form of corruption. They saw this as being at odds with Republican liberty, and they feared it would deepen inequality in American society and subvert the public good. So they opposed this plan. This is a quick refresher for those of you who uh, haven't been teaching time law and don't, don't remember this uh, debate. The opposition to Hamilton's finance friendly version of national greatness is what led to the formation of what became the Democratic. All right, fast forward two centuries. The Democratic Party, by this time, by the 1990s and by the 2000s, the Democratic Party made its peace with finance driven and with concentrated economic power. In fact, Hamilton's way of thinking about the economy and government had prevailed so completely that it was hard to recall what that debate was about. Unlike Jefferson, whose marble memorial in Washington, D.C. sits resplendent in the tidal basin, Hamilton has no monument in the nation's capital. But it might be said that his monument consists in the country he helped bring into being. He didn't need one. An economic power, an economic superpower in the thrall of commerce and finance. <clears throat> However, 
By 2015, Hamilton's monument arrived, not in Washington, but on Broadway, <laughs> in the spectacularly successful hip hop musical Hamilton. Did you see it? Some of you? <laughs> okay. I wonder if more people have seen Hamilton the musical than have been to the Jefferson Memorial. <laughs> It's multicultural depiction of the founders, actors of color cast in the starring roles, dazzled audiences. Scholars pointed out that the musical exaggerated Hamilton's abolitionist credentials and overlooked his role buying and selling slaves for his in laws. The show also gave scant attention to Hamilton's primary achievement which was to be the founding father of American finance, the founding father of Wall Street and his connection to American government. Instead, what was the play about? It was, a, it was an exuberant celebration of Hamilton's meritocratic rise from humble origins as an immigrant to the Caribbean. And the opening song, do you remember the lyrics? And the opening song that you committed to memory? Mm -hmm. In case not, they go like this. How does a bastard orphan son of a whore and a Scotsman, dropped in the middle of a forgotten spot in the Caribbean by Providence, impoverished and smaller, grow up to be a hero and a scholar? That's the opening question of the musical. And the answer, the song tells us, he got a lot farther by working a lot harder, by being a lot smarter, by being a self scouter Hamilton was a Broadway rendition of the meritocratic rhetoric of rising that was the dominant political idiom and rhetoric of the 1980s and 90s and 2000s. Young Hamilton became a national hero that teaches us the cuts through brilliance and hard work he was determined to rise as far as his talents would take him. Just as politicians of the center left and center right had been telling Americans to do, if you want to compete and win in the global economy, go to college. What you learn will depend on what you learn. That was Bill Clinton. You can make it if you try. That was Barack Obama. 140 times, by the way. He used that phrase. Obama did in speeches at a rally. Hamilton would not throw away his shot at what would become the American dream. This is from another song. Remember, I'm not throwing away my shot. Hey, yo, I'm just like my country. I'm young, scrappy, and hungry, and I'm not throwing away my shot. It rocks. It's a duke of song. So here was Hamilton's monument. It was also an anthem for the age of Obama. The musical brilliantly fused three strands of the liberalism of the 2000 teens, multiculturalism, meritocracy, and just on stage, finance-driven capitalism. Obama saw the production several times, invited the cast to perform at the White House, and joked about his bipartisan appeal. Hamilton, he said, I'm pretty sure is the only thing that Dick Cheney and I agree on. <laughs> but even as the blockbuster musical brought the meritocratic finance driven faith to a moment of dazzling efflorescence, the public philosophy for which it stood was losing its capacity to inspire. After four decades of stagnant wages, for the average worker, upward mobility was no longer an answer to inequality. Those who had brought the hyper-globalized, financialized economy into being admonished those left behind to improve themselves so that they too could compete and win in the global economy. But the elites had missed the mood of discontent by the 2000 themes. For those struggling to make ends meet, the mantra, you can make it if you try, was now heard less as a promise than as a taunt 
I didn't hear that. Those who enunciated. Less than two weeks after Hamilton swept the Tony Awards, Britain voted to leave the European Union. And a few months later, Trump was elected president, backed by many voters in rural America and in industrial communities, hollowed out by globalization. But one more thing. The, the confidence, the hubristic confidence that Globalization is simply a fact of nature beyond human control. This too, in the years after 2016, had began to be called into question. It had partly to do with the aftermath of the financial crash and the financial crisis. It had partly to do with the pandemic. And it became increasingly clear, and this brings us up to the place where the new edition ends, that what set the market faith of these years so deeply at odds with the project of self government was its evasion of the political. By this, I mean the persistent attempt by proponents of this picture this finance driven globalization their persistent attempts to depict the economic arrangements that they brought into being the fact of nature beyond human control because according to this logic according to their logic free trade agreements the unfettered flow of capital the financialization of economic life offshoring of jobs, deregulation, the recurring financial crisis, the declining labor share of GDP, and the advent of technologies favoring higher skilled workers. All of these were necessary features of a global economy, not contestable developments open to political freedom. This way of thinking about the economy left little room for public debate about how to distribute goods, or to allocate investment, or to determine the social value of this or that job. In short, it hollowed out public discourse and fueled deeper, growing sense of disempowerment. <laughs> if the basic terms of economic life are alterable facts of nature, then little is left for self government. Politics is reduced to the task bowing to necessity. The necessity, for example, of a Wall Street bailout, which even those who enacted it said was moral trouble. If politics is mainly about adapting to the fixed inheritance of economic life, it's an activity better suited to experts and technocrats than this. So we have this grunting conception of politics. That defines the age of globalization. And it co coincided, as it happens, with an inflated role for doctrinaire economists who claim to offer a science of this supposed necessity. But theirs was a spurious science. And the policymakers who imbibed it mismanaged the economy, exacerbated inequality, and created the conditions, this is the main point, for the angry backlash and toxic politics. So where does that leave us now? Because uh, we survey the wreckage of the rancorous organization that has come in the wake of this failed public philosophy. Well, it seems to me that surveying the wreckage, which we have to see whether it is possible and what it would look like to reconnect with this older tradition, this civic aspiration, the political economy. So we need to recall that governing the economy 
needs more than figuring out how to maximize GDP, and even more than distributing the fruits of economic growth. It requires that we reconsider the way we live with one another and with the natural world that we inhabit. Aristotle taught, going way back to the civic conception, that politics is not only for the sake of easing commerce and exchange, but also for the sake of the good life. To be a citizen is to deliberate about the best way to live, about the virtues that make us fully human. Now, contemporary liberalism considers this way of thinking of politics too ambitious because in pluralist societies we disagree about the good life, and so we should set aside our moral disagreements when we enter the public square. But this tension for neutrality is what's fatal. It, it bends liberalism in the direction of the market faith. When the neoliberal faith was at high tide, as I mentioned earlier, Tony Blair mocked those who wanted to debate globalization. You might as well debate, he said, whether autumn should follow summer. It was smart at the time, but it now seems quaint. Climate change, after all, has reconfigured the season. Summer heat is arriving earlier and staying longer. Some scientists predict that absent changes in the way we live by the end of the century, summer will last for half a year. Here's an example of the folly of the conception of the economy as a fact of nature. But one seen an unalterable fact of nature. The weather, the climate, has now become inescapable a subject for self-government. And so the boundary of what's necessary and what's possible shifts beneath our feet. Civic tradition understands this. It's a fundamentally political tradition. So today, the civic aspiration to shape the forces that govern our lives requires us to debate and to decide whether autumn should follow summer. And if we can debate that, we can surely debate the economic arrangements by which we live. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, Professor Sandell. And now we will, well, we do have time for um, some questions. And so I would ask my colleague, Professor Schmidt, um uh, to to call on folks as as you raise your hands <coughs> that was really great and <laughs> um thank you very much um so i uh i think your description of globalism not being inevitable and of course nature is completely right um but let me ask you something you lean very heavily on self-government and one of the core questions is who's that self Right, because political communities are also not just acts of nature. Right, right. And so, um, so I guess I'm very sympathetic to the idea that we have to think about a politics that um, takes citizenship seriously and brings about social solidarity. But when I get involved in that project, I naturally think, what's the role of states and the appropriate size of states and political communities? And I, so I wonder if you could say, something about that. I think you're right. The self and self-government is not fixed once and for all, but it's up for grabs. It's one of the subjects of political contest and debate and deliberation itself. I think that's a really important point. And what I, I've suggested here is that a purely global conception of the economy uh, accompanied by a purely universalist cosmopolitan conception of community and identity are unlikely to be satisfying and more to the point are unlikely to be adequate vehicles for the project of self-government which suggests uh, the need for intermediate levels of political community to situate the selves of self-government, to give them definition. 
And uh, you ask, well, what does that look like exactly? What sort of configuration? What distribution that maybe one would ask in roles and responsibilities at different levels of government would be suitable? I think it depends. I think that's a practical question that can only be answered through experiment and through experience. And the right answer may differ one historical moment to the next. So I think that's what the experiment and that's what the deliberation um, has to attend to. I think you've identified the question. I would only hesitate to offer a kind of fix or, or, or formulaic answer to that question. You have to take that question seriously and then try to work out the forms of political community and the forms of subsidiarity or federalism <laughs> that distributes roles and responsibilities among the levels of government and also uh, within civil society, because civil society also shapes the character of citizens um, in a way that we would be empowering. Uh, it's an alternative to the kind of technocratic uh, that you have. That's, uh, I don't know if that's a fully satisfying answer, but I, I think it's hard to be more precise in general. Sure. Um, my question is uh, similar in some ways to Mark's. Um, first of all, this was fascinating, and um, thank you so much for being here. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about your conception of nationhood. Uh, this is actually sort of from the other perspective, from the other side of what Mark was asking. Yeah. Um, because there's there is something intrinsically exclusive about nationhood or political community. Yes. Right? There are people who aren't in it, and uh, in our world today, <clears throat> even if it were desirable to ignore that. The people who aren't in our community is actually not possible. Right. So how do you think about that? Well, and reinforcing your observation is the fact that one of the most volatile public questions of the day is immigration, in terms of entry. And I think that the Democratic Party in particular has failed to address the question of immigration and left the way open to, uh, to harsh and um, disagreeable uh, ways of addressing the problem of immigration. And there's a broader question that um, we point to, which is the role of the nation in the place of patriotism in politics. Liberals, well, one of the defects of liberalism that I uh, that, that I worry about in the nineteen nineties, but it was allowing uh, the right to have a monopoly on the question of patriotism. Is it patriotism or a fixed thing with a set of prescriptions and policies as the right defines patriotism? The it's not enough for liberals to answer, well, we're for freedom or we're for justice. Liberals have to have a conception of community and of common purposes and ends. And so far as liberals care about uh, building a, a generous welfare state, that reflects the mutual obligation of citizens to one another, they must have at least an implicit uh, answer to these questions, an implicit conception of national community and patriotism. And so far as we don't want companies to be able to send jobs overseas to low wage countries with few labor protections, let's say, to the detriment of American workers following out the industrial Midwest. Two, that critique also implies, but often doesn't articulate, a certain conception of national community and of solidarity, which is to say of patriotism. So perhaps one way of 
redefining the political economy of citizenship for our time is to speak more openly and directly about patriotism, perhaps including economic patriotism as a way of articulating the, the critique of, of companies or billionaires who park their funds or who have fictitious uh, company charters brought to avoid paying their share of American taxes and American tax laws. Now, liberals have raised these issues. Why not raise them under the broader moral umbrella of patriotism or national unity or mutual responsibility, economic patriotism? That would be one way of reconnecting with, with um, citizenship. It might begin to join the issue at least, rather than to see the resonant, potent appeal of patriotism to a right wing construal of what patriotism means. And that will also require having a cogent answer about immigration. Uh, are we for open borders? If so, make the case for that. If not, what should be the principle of admission? And how does that principle connect with a sense of special responsibility? We believe we have such a responsibility to our fellow citizens. It's easy to see why liberals shrink from some of that, because that's very difficult. But I think we that um, I think liberals shrink from engaging patriotism and the immigration question uh, to their own detriment. Uh, and I think this will unfortunately need to be our, our last question. So there you also honored to be able to ask the last question. Uh, thank you, Professor Sandel. Uh, I think if we took a national poll. Uh, the Generation Z probably would be the largest percentage of supporters of your two views on political, econ political economy and community. And I'm just wondering, based on your first edition to this edition, whether you think that the millennials, you know, back at your first edition, had comparable views to what I'm positing, Generation Z. And is there any reason to be optimistic that the, from the Generation Z, so to speak, the leaders of this country will kind of effectuate the different attitudinal changes that you'd like to see? No, what a welcome suggestion. <laughs> <laughs> that the, uh, the new edition will speak to the rising generation. Um, that would be a kind of dream come true, wouldn't it? But um, I think it's possible, if only because the seemingly iron grip, the unalterable world picture, uh, the, the world picture of the finance-driven version of globalization that predominated and can so constrained debate for four plus decades, it's now in tatters, it's now in disarray. And I think there's a kind of restedness, uh, um, uh, especially among the younger generation, um, about finding alternatives, including alternatives, which I find everywhere I go, speaking to young people, that there is a hunger to engage in public with big substantive questions, a hunger for a morally more robust kind of public discourse than the technocratic kinds which we become accustomed to, and which maybe the younger generation associates with the failed policies of, and the follies of the past and of their predecessor generation. I don't know whether how that will play out, but I think there are stirrings that suggest it may be possible. So I would distinguish between Optimism and hope. <laughs> in the midst of this rancor and polarization, it's difficult, and, and the oligarchic hold of, of large companies and the wealthy on our political system, it's hard to be optimistic. But look at speaking with and listening to 
the younger generation noticing their yearning, their hunger for a public life of larger meaning that addresses these questions. That's ground, if not for optimism exactly, at least for hope. Thank you very much.